Thank you, Amanda, and good morning, everybody. It really is um, a thrill for me to be here. Um, I feel um, as if I am more, more and more a Melbourne resident, although I, I continue to live in Sydney because my daughter um, is now in her second year in an arts degree at Melbourne University. So I find myself coming to Melbourne not just for, for work, um, but also as a mother of a, a young woman who is thriving here in Melbourne. Um, I'd like to start, of course, by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past and present and to acknowledge all First Nations peoples who may be joining us today. I also think it's important that we acknowledge the room that we're in here at the State Library of Victoria for this important day of acknowledgement of women and women in our history and women in Victoria's history because we're in the Isabella Fraser room, so named after, I think, the, the library believes the first or one of the first women employees of the State Library of Victoria. So this wonderful room recently designed to host events like this in honour of a woman who worked in this place um, from the earliest time. So wonderful to be celebrating women philanthropy, women in Victoria um, in all facets um, as we, we, we celebrate the Collier Fund here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the boards, the staff and the partners of the Collier Charitable Foundation a Fund, I'm sorry, and the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, particularly those that are here today who are delivering the programs that are, are, the, are the consequence of the generosity of those two philanthropic organisations. As Amanda has said, um, earlier this year I was invited to chair the Australian Women Donors Network, 10 years after it was founded by two extraordinary Melbourne women philanthropists who felt very strongly about supporting women and girls and advancing gender equality. Eve Marlab, who unfortunately can't be with us today because she's travelling internationally, and Jill Reichstein, who is here uh, joining us today, along with Carol Schwartz and leaders of other women's funds, established the AWDN to promote gender direct investment, great, I'm sorry, greater direct investment in women and girls, but also to promote the application of a gender lens across all issues and at all levels of philanthropic practice. And I follow Deanne Weir as chair of the AWDN, another Sydney cider who is doing, doing great work um, privately and philanthropically uh, with Women's Moving Millions, but many other philanthropic ventures that you, you may know about. So to be here today celebrating over $100 million distributed in grants by the Collier Charitable Fund is truly a great honour. And just to hear a little bit more about Alice, Annette and Edith is marvellous and I'm going to investigate their lives a bit more fully um, having come to them late but to hear them described and to know a little bit about their lives and what generated those moments um, when they came together to give so generously and so clearly and to generate a fund that today stands at $80 million in the corpus and to have granted $100 million, that leveraging of that generosity is quite extraordinary by those three m mostly unknown women, young women, who decided that I think fairly early on in their lives, long before they probably wrote their wills, that that's the kind of legacy that they would use um, via their father and, and a, I think a family commitment um, to our country. And I think as many of you in this room would already know, the history of philanthropy in Australia is rich with the charity of women, with vision and generosity, many of whom have used their legacies or their time and their current effort to improve the lives of other women and girls. But the generosity and foresight of Alice, Annette and Edith and, and the commitment of the trustees to date who have managed that fund so expertly and so carefully is a superb example of leadership by women, supported by men, I'm sure, on the trust, but somewhat flying under the radar without the sort of national recognition we would expect to come alongside such vision and contribution. I'm not sure if you saw the Financial Review's special report last week about the, the great philanthropy in Australia and the women philanthropists that graced the cover of the magazine. Um, they looked strong and imposing and, and their generosity was given but their ability to, to affect the country was clear from that, that extraordinary photograph on the front of the magazine. And I wonder whether um, the Collier sisters today, if they were around, would feel comfortable um, gracing the cover of a magazine or whether they would still be very quiet and unassuming women um, providing their philanthropy with such grace. Um, as with so many successes of women, we're only now realising the opportunity to celebrate these leaders, as I say. Um, 
And if we are to increase philanthropy, particularly philanthropy directed at women or by women in Australia, philanthropists do need to feel proud about giving, and particularly the giving by and to women. In recent years, we've seen great leadership by women philanthropists and donors right across the spectrum of our society and with so many different forms. Audette Excel with her um, engaged philanthropy using business leaders. Um, Jane Hanson, Judith Nielsen, Sam Mears, um, amongst many, many more. These are women who are taking that role, I, I think, uh, given to us by the Collier sisters and stretching and pushing it out and doing things in a way that is setting the benchmark for leadership in philanthropy. And I'm particularly pleased that accompanying that rise, we now have much greater understanding about the remarkable impact that investment in women and girls has on our entire society and our communities, whether that's coming from women or men, and hopefully from both. So if I start with a, philosophy, a, a, a story that probably underscores that philosophy, I heard Lucy Turnbull share um, a really special story a couple of years ago in her role as chair of the Greater Sydney Commission, which is involved in the design of the great cityscapes of Sydney. And she used the opportunity to talk to a group of women about the fact that, in her mind, if we designed our cities, our public spaces and our communities, just to meet the needs of a woman from her birth throughout the entirety of her life to the end of her life, we would have very different facilities. Our facilities would be designed that would accommodate girls who wanted to go out safely and not feel that they would be subjected to any unsafe practices by people around them. Young women would be out jogging and using the, the, the um, public spaces in the way that men always have, again, without fear, but running and being f um, fully, um, fully supportive of using their bodies for fitness in ways that perhaps it's hard in our cities today because of fear and concern about um, the responses that many women get when they are out using their bodies. Um, early parenting, the pushing of prams, the getting on and off of public transport for women who, I'm um, seeing nods in the audience already, and I know that feeling of um, getting around a city with, a, with a, a young baby and then a young, a young child. Families using facilities um, because of the way women would like to have family events. Um, fitness and health for women my age, um, not, again, not without fear. So that would, that would assume that there are facilities and lighting and that the city itself embraces women to feel a fully engaged, fully full of their agency in our cities. And of course, throughout all of that, taking, um, take, using the beauty of our cities and our public spaces to enliven our sense of community. Now, if all of those things were done just to benefit women and girls across the course of their life, of course, everyone prospers. Because by taking that slightly different edge, and actually acknowledging that applying a gender lens to the design of the city would actually have enormous benefits for everybody. Every man, every boy, in addition to every woman and every girl, would enjoy that city in a way that we don't today. And so for me, it was a proxy for what gender lens investing looks like. It's a philosophical thought that when we deal with people who have special requirements, and I'm sad to say women do have special requirements when it comes to things just like the design of cities or our international aid program um, or poverty or homelessness, that that gender lens provides a way that benefits all. And I hope I can leave you with the thought that the gender lens is not just about improving the lives of women and girls. It's about improving our entire society in which we all prosper. Another example, recently on International Women's Day, um, our Foreign Minister, Senator Maurice Payne, spoke about when she first started thinking about gender in the context of the delivery of the um, disaster relief services, particularly in the Pacific. And she'd come back from one particular event where the women of the Pacific were very grateful for the Australian um, Defence Force coming in after one of those terrible events in the Pacific, offering aid. But there were, at the front line of that delivery of emergency services were generally men. And a lot of the women in the communities in the Pacific couldn't receive the aid because of their state of undress or their state of um, um, homelessness and felt they couldn't face men to receive that, those gifts and that support. And so the minister asked of the Department of Foreign Affairs to make sure that women from the Defence Force were part of that first wave of support in the disaster relief effort that Australia is so good at. And just in that small act of a gender lens on the delivery of a program to assist others, mostly women in those communities, our aid and our disaster relief was so much more effective and has now become part of the way that the Defence Departments and our um, uh, uh, all those that work on behalf of the Commonwealth to dealing with that disaster relief alongside um, the great not-for-profit communities, by putting women at the front, our delivery of aid and, and relief is so much greater. They're just two examples I think of when I think about the gender lens and how it, how it helps all. 
And the lens may not have been familiar to the Collier sisters. We weren't using this language in their lifetime. Um, but when I heard about the specific things they were giving to, it seems to me that they had in their mind some prefer preferencing and some of the issues that affect women and that go to great societies. Um, and it, but it does surprise me even today that this idea of the gender lens is not a concept that is widely and purposefully embraced. It is an approach that's being embraced in some parts of philanthropy as the evidence demonstrates that applying the gender lens also enhances the impact of the philanthropic investment. And if we are to ensure that women and girls are included in the benefits of philanthropically funded programs and that the, philanthrop the philanthropy actually addresses structural gender inequality rather than just the fallout of that structural inequality, then the gender lens applied, applied rigorously and purposefully and generously provides one of the best pathways to that outcome. So it's also really pleasing and worthy of note that uh, Catherine Brown here today from the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation has been applying the gender lens in giving from that foundation. And um, it's really pleasing to see that already being ad adopted by great leaders here in Melbourne. But it does need to be adopted by more. Our Chief Executive at AWDN, Julie Riley, who joins us here today, um, a powerhouse of this area of philanthropy, has long advocated both the philosophy and the practice of gender lens investing. And during her Churchill Fellowship, which she conducted last year across the, across the world, she discovered that our collective failure is on a global scale and that we, we, we haven't thought about this um, properly enough and we certainly haven't collected and interrogated the data on investing in women. And it's meant that we've been significantly underplaying the impact that data-driven gender lens philanthropic giving could achieve. Julie is joined by no less than, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who she met with as part of her work, and whose um, 2019 annual letter to people interested in their work um, have cited this lack of reliable data on the impact of investing in women as one of the most surprising and alarming features of giving across the world. Bill and Melinda Gates identified that an artificial divide between women's issues and others and the failure to gather data on women's actual progress to inform gender lens giving, and I'll quote them here, blocks progress for everyone. You can't improve things if you don't know what's going on with half the population. Melinda particularly said, and I'll quote her, the missing data about women and girls and their lives is so harmful. It gets in the way of helping improve their lives. It's also about the data we do have, data that policymakers depend on. And that data at the moment is bad. You might even call it sexist. We like to think of data as being objective, but the answers we get are often shaped by the questions we ask. When those questions are biased, the data is too. There's the words of Melinda Gates. And it's also what Julie discovered on her travels around the world and back here in Australia, that we've been relying very heavily on data that doesn't actually purposefully apply a gender lens to understand what actually happens in women's lives that would be improved upon by the giving, not just to women, but to issues that affect predominantly women. Now, in their case, the Gates are now pursuing a very strong policy of collecting and analysing the missing data of women across the world. So um, instead of just in the international sphere, where they have a very strong program, particularly on women's maternal health, they've always had data on women's reproductive health. They know a lot about what, it, what that means and what the investment in reproductive health in the developing economies means but they've never known about the economic position of any woman in any community in those countries. They're now going to look at that economic position of those women, their own income, their time, everything that they are doing in households, rather than continuing to ignore their contribution by taking simply a household view, which in the data collected by global philanthropy, rolls up the income of the home as a household and ascribes that income to men. And so the giving is actually being constructed around the fact that the only people earning money for those homes in those countries are men because the household income hasn't been unpacked to deal with the contribution of women in those households, even if it's small. Um, and so the Gates Foundation, along with others, is going to change the whole way they look at the data and the evidence that they will then use to make their investments in women, whether it's maternal health or in the economies in which they are operating. Now, I could go on and on about this topic because it's one that's so profound and so important, but it goes to the heart of why philanthropy by women but for women um, is so terribly important so that not a dollar is wasted and that the impact is felt right across our societies. So just thinking about data in Australia, I don't want to 
really depress everybody because we do very well on many things in this country and I'd like to use the sustainable development goals as a, a way of just giving a very quick update on, on where women sit and where their progress is not so great. Australia, as you would know, is a signatory to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It's the reason I wear my SDGs pin to remind myself every day about the fact that we've got less about 10 years to go to 2030 to actually see that all of the goals, including Goal 5, which is gender equality in all its forms, is met. It's a very big goal by 2030. And Australia, as a, um, a signatory to the goals and a, also a key designer of the goals, is on the hook to report on how we're going. And I just thought you might like to know that on those goals, Australia does really, really well on the health and education goals in particular. But there are two where we're performing very, very poorly. One of them, I don't think either will surprise you, one is particularly bad and that's climate change and our movement on environmental issues. So we'll park that for the moment, although you could also apply a gender lens to leadership in climate change and come up with some interesting opportunities to invest. Um, but growing inequality, particularly for women in this country, is one of our worst performing attributes of the goals under SDG 5 and under the goals that go to growing inequality. So I also chair something called ANROS, the Australian National Research Organisation for Women and Children's Safety. It's a COAG body um, that deals with all the evidence base on family and domestic violence. And our partner organisation um, is Our Watch, chaired by Natasha Stott Despoyer. And between us, we work on the evidence base and then all of the work that goes out to the community on primary prevention and the, the stories that need to be told about what really is going on with family and domestic violence in this country. So some background figures. We know that the gender pay gap is stubbornly sitting at about 16%. We know that women's average superannuation holdings for women in the 60 to 64 year old age groups are half those of their men counterparts. And we know that one in two women in this country today has or will report experiencing workforce discrimination or some form of um, assault in the workplace. That's one in two women. I come to the work that, um, that Natasha and I do with our teams at ANROSE and at Our Watch. One in three women have experienced some form of physical or sexual violence since the age of 15. One in four have experienced often extreme violence or um, it can be any form of violence from physical, sexual um, or coercive control with finances and the like. One in four women experience that kind of violence by an intimate current or former partner. One in four, and it's, it is almost moving to, to the, closer to one in three in some parts of the country. Last week, just around the corner from here in Chinatown, I'm sure you were all aghast once again when the beautiful, beautiful young woman, Natalina Angok's body was found again a victim of another horrendous form of of horrific violence against uh, against a woman. And so far this year in Australia, 18 women are no longer with us as the victims of um, a, a murder um, by a current or former partner for the most part. So today, intimate partner violence is probably the greatest health risk factor for all women in the cohort 25 to 44. If you're a 25-year-old woman between 25 and 44, Intimate partner violence is now a greater health risk for you than smoking or alcohol or your heart problems. It's an extraordinary figure to reflect on and think about. 72,000 women and 34,000 of their children have sought homelessness services in the, in the um, financial year 15-16 due to a family or, or domestic violence incidents. And that number is growing. And so when we think about how we invest in women's homelessness or homelessness per se, the lack of a gender lens that gives you all of that data that would tell you about what are the structural issues that drive to a woman now being the most likely person to be living on a street or seeking services for her children. It's no longer a man, it's a woman. Simply giving, giving money to homelessness, which is terribly, terribly important, but not giving to the things that drive those women to being on the street in the first place, we miss a part of what women's philanthropy can be about. And it's very easy to turn that data into a prescription for greater investment um, in, our, in our economy and in our society. Um, also worth thinking about the fact that Australian women account for 68% of all primary care. 68% all prim of primary carers in this country are women. 70% of the primary unpaid carers for children are women. 58% of the primary unpaid carers for the elderly or people with disabilities or long-term health issues are women. Our workforce, sadly, has become one of the most gender segregated in the entire world. 
they've got women stuck in gender segregated fields where, where they can't get um, a better income, can't get savings and are stuck with, um, with terribly stubborn low, low rates of, of income and support doing the heavy lifting on care, education and the things we say we value as a society. And so if we understood all of that and thought about where does philanthropy by men and women but for women sit, then we might think differently about the starting point. And we might think a bit like the Collier sisters about who are those people who are most of need of social welfare and poverty relief, because increasingly they are women. Not entirely, but they are increasingly women in large numbers. And we don't account for them and unpack them, as the, as the Gates Foundation says. So I thought I'd just finish with a quick story that is less about philanthropy and more about women activating a space um, where men couldn't, and what comes of that, and then the role of philanthropy in that. And I'm sorry that I've had to come to it at the end of the speech, but it is about football. And um, I'm hoping that I can get away with this in a Melbourne audience more than I can up north. Um, because you, you would know the impact that the AFL has and football has had on communities for, for generations. Um, it has been a, place, a meeting place for sorting out all sorts of things in communities, well beyond what we see at the big games and the, the big control that the AFL has running that multi-billion dollar business. Um, but for my mind, the AFL, along with some other sports, has played the role of a silent social worker in many instances um, with families and supporting communities among, amongst many other players um, in, our, in our societies. Um, but the AFL was incapable of seeing that women wanting to play the game was part of the future of the game and of supporting the communities that had always supported football. So when I arrived on the commission in 2005 and by 2006 had been approached by women playing the game who had been ignored and told they had no right to have an ambition to play the game they could be on boards, they could, not even on boards really, they could be, they could be on the fundraising committees of, of footy clubs, they could be running the, the dinners for the players, they could be doing, doing the historian work for the clubs, but they couldn't play. When I first raised that, the response from the very senior people at the AFL was one that I still um, hold with, with great concern about what happens when women are not present around those big discussions at the very beginning of strategy and understanding um, the community. Because their belief was that women shouldn't play, it wasn't a good look for the AFL, only certain women played and they weren't women that you sort of wanted out there as um, out the front of the, of the branding for the game. They had no idea but they thought that I was mad and they thought the women that had approached me to use my efficacy and my agency on the commission to, uh, to fight for them, um, they thought we were all mad. In a good, I mean, no, they, weren't, they weren't mean, they, weren't, they didn't know what they didn't know but they didn't have a gender lens across the game of Australian rules football that could tell them about one of the greatest spaces for opportunity and the one they were missing that was insulting so many women and girls was a human rights issue at one level but a growth of the game and a growth of community in another and was going to make lots of money for them ultimately if they got hold of it. So it wasn't a charitable act, it was more about a fundamental um, misunderstanding of who was interested in football as players. It took 10 years but when the, when the AFL Women's League launched in 2017 so lockout and incredible crowds to three years later to sitting at the Adelaide Oval with 53,000 other fans watching a grand final of a women's game that is the powerhouse of the new interest in the game. That started with women coming to me as an advocate for them on the commission, shared then by Linda Desso when she joined the commission and of course has gone on to be your, your great governor, the other women who joined the commission and then the men because we started to frame the future of football with women as players and women as full advocates and full participants into the mix of the strategy. Without those moments of putting a gender lens at the front, I don't think we would, we would still have a respectful opportunity for women to play the game. And in the meantime, the, um, the growth of the game across the country is being driven by women and girls and families where young boys are playing the game for the first time because they first saw the game played by women. Fundamental shifts in the, in the future of the game and the sport and what it will be doing and a different form of sportsmanship, a different form of how women compete that's sending a message at a time when women's sport has become somewhat corrupted and bedevilled by poor behaviour and poor representation of us on the international stage. So if you think about what the AFLW represents, it's, a, it's an example of what's happened in women's sport across the world, but particularly for Australia, for the women who now represent our country at the highest level and come home with gold medals. They're extraordinary. They're exemplars of their sport, but also of what it means to be a leader in this country as women. They often can't get philanthropic support because sport kind of is hard to, to back. But if I think about the philanthropic gesture that actually lifted 
this from a theory to practice. It was Susan Alberti. And it was Susan saying she would put money in without any, any recognition at the time. She's now recognised for it, quite rightly. But the, for those years, during that 10 years of fighting, it was Susan Alberti's generous, generous philanthropic gifts directly to the women, paying for their airfares, paying for their Guernseys, and then paying for their clubs to actually do the, the fundamental work to welcome those women in when the AFL was absent. That was a generous act of philanthropy. And I kind of like to think that that's where Alice, Annette and Edith might have been at a time as Victorians. Um, they might have been interested in the sport. I don't know. I don't know enough about what they were like in their day-to-day lives. I suspect not, but maybe, maybe they, they liked it a bit. Maybe their dad did. I don't know. But Susan Alberti and the women I've spoken about and the many of you here today um, are, the, are the women, I think, that we need to keep listening to and thinking about and well served by the evidence and the data that will tell us why investing in women as philanthropists, as businesses, as communities, improves our society as a whole. And we could do a lot less than just using the celebration of the Collier's $100 million gift to this nation um, as the reason to inspire us to do better. So thank you very much. Thank you.